Okay, are we having a party here? I don't know. Welcome to Polishing Profits. Join our three industry experts boasting 140 years of experience as they unlock building service contracting secrets that can revolutionize your business. There's the opener, folks. Old guys nap. Welcome to another another titillating session of Polishing Profits. It's just that time of year, you know. What can I tell you? Anyway, you welcome. Why you said guys. Old guys now. Yeah. Old guys now. Yeah. Old guys now. They do. And you're not going to have any problem figuring out who the two old guys are on this one. So if you do, then maybe we better talk about another topic. Anyway, yeah. that'll get everybody thinking. We're going to get a little controversial and go where angels fear to tread and Ed Selkow likes to go. I think that's right. Yeah, Ed? Yes. Yeah, no, I got, you know, all, all I need is, you know, just a few more industry experts that want to cut my throat and I'll be, I'll be fine. You know? <laughs> no, you're safe in this room. Of course, we're all virtual. So anyway, with that said, today's topic and probably our final episode for this period is going to be, so I want to grow. Okay. Everybody wants to grow. So our question is, who is going to take over the part of your job you need to delegate to grow your business? And the sad fact is that, and, and we do a lot of consulting between the three of us, and I'd guess we probably have, what, 80 years of consulting experience between all of us? Just flat consulting experience, what? talking yeah. to people, tens of thousands of customers, millions of words. And you want to grow and you say, great, how are you going to do that? And they go, well, we're going to bring on more business. Well, who's going to do what you were doing? And you kind of get a blank stare. Well, I think I've got a few people. Well, what do you want to add next year in your business? A million dollars. You better have more than a few people. So the question is, do you have one or two select people that you are preparing, educating, and moving forward to take over parts of your job so you can continue to grow the company? And the title's basically, who's your second in command? And do you have more than one of those identified? And Ed, since you uh, thought of this topic, I'm going to give you first shot out the gate. Uh, your thoughts on your second in command well, and having people in place to grow. Well, I always open that up with my clients with, listen, I want to ask you a question. You know, we're going to be tracking all this growth and stuff. And uh, what I want to know is what happens if you get hit by a car and are laid up in the hospital, which happens. That happens mm -hmm. from time to time. That happens, okay? What happens to your company? How much stuff are you personally holding together in order to stay current? And that's where the rubber meets the road on this second-in-command thing, especially when they're no longer kids. Look, we're all invincible in our 30s and part of our 40s, and we begin to figure out in our 40s. But past that, what are you going to do? Your family depends on this. So do you have somebody identified you're working with? And again, you need more than one somebody because they may have problems and have to bail or leave. So mm -hmm. what are you doing? What is your succession plan for yourself and to groom managers? Sharon, you've got some thoughts on this because you work with clients yeah. all the time that are looking to I, build succession. <laughs> right. And looking to get out of the day to day. And sometimes they don't even know they need to get out of the weeds they're buried in. They don't know what they don't know. And they're doing things that someone else can do. And we address a lot of this in our series about delegation. But it becomes critical because, in, in my opinion, the company should be able to function without you. And mm -hmm. the situation Ed alluded to is very real. And it happens. Mm -hmm. And a company, when you know you've, when you've got a well-oiled machine, that can operate. Sales can be made. Walkthroughs can be done. Uh, proposals written. Human resource issues dealt with. When those things are functioning in your business, then you've got a well-oiled machine. You cannot mm -hmm. do that by yourself. When you're at, at under a million dollars, maybe you can get away with it a little bit. But as you approach the million, then two and three, certainly once over that two million mark, you have to have somebody who is your second in command and who can function 
should you leave the company? Really, I, I, I am working with somebody now, and I've said, people should not know whether you're in the office or not. They shouldn't know where you are. It should be that fine-tuned and that well. You're there to motivate, pat on the back, review reports, oversee, but you have to have that second person command that does that for you. And so I've had some discussions with people on the same line, Sharon, and we're looking at their org chart. And then my question is, well, who in this organization right now, and let's say they're under 3 million, can grow and take over while you go do other things? Because you've got to be able to duplicate yourself or parts of your job for you to go on and do the things you want to do. That's just the fact of life. And we'll go through the roster and there's nobody there. I mean, he's done the work. She's done the work, looked at everything. Nobody's promotable. Well, what's the next step? Mm -hmm. Well, start advertising for help and finding somebody who fits what you need. And the question was, well, how do I do that? Very simple. Look at the items you want to delegate. You want to get off your plate. Look at the skill sets necessary, necessary that look at the skill sets that are necessary to take over the items that you want to delegate and then hire to both. Can they take that over currently? And what can I expand on as I continue to delegate them? But you have to have somebody in the chair in your company. If you're over a million, you've got to be grooming a successor mm -hmm. for the things you need to delegate. And whether you're sales oriented, you want to go into sales or you're ops oriented, want to go into ops, you've got to have somebody to take those tasks, those jobs to be done and do them so you can do other things. And if you don't well, have you that, to... you'll grow, but it'll be bad. Go ahead. No, you no, no. have to create the position. And that starts with the job description and where they fall on the org chart. Where does that where does that position fall? And getting a job description down, getting it on paper. We've said it a million times. You can't just have it in your head. Well, I want them to do this, so I need them to do that. You have to see it in front of you and interview to that job description and find the, the person that's going to fit best for you. Well, also, there should be a, a factor of complementary skills, okay? And what I've seen is the difference in the background of the founders and what that means to the company. People that came out of sales, you know, have a very strong sales situation. Those people that came out of, in any business, came out of operations, they're operations focused, Okay. The problem is they don't always get along. As far as the operations right. guy goes, man, the, you know, the sales guy's a drunk. And when was the last time you bought something decent in here? And blah, 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 blah. You know, and then the sales guy say, look, this guy's hiding in, in, in a janitor's closet somewhere. That's why we got complaints. So right. this was the scenario. And it's very clear. It's true. From, from back in time, sales and operations never even when I was in the retail business, the sales side and the ops side, never. There was always a conflict. Ops could find all the reasons you couldn't do it, and sales could find no reason. What do you mean you can't do it? You can do it, you know, and so it, that's just historical. They always. That reminds me of the problem between day crew and night crew. Yeah. Who yeah. Does Day crew never leaves us in a good stead for us. The night crew didn't do all their job. We had to start by, oh, gee, I used to hate those pass downs. Yeah. Getting everyone to cooperate. So, yeah. yeah that I just did. And that hasn't ended. Even people I coach that have larger businesses, they can have day crew, night crew issues. Because when something doesn't get done, rather than step up and say, yeah, I yeah. own it, I'll fix it. It's, yeah. It's very interesting. So, back to our original question you know, who are you going to call when you're ready to move on? Yeah, and, and finding the, the strength the, of the work. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't do it when you add another uh, $100,000 worth of business. That when yeah. you're, While you're trying to start a new account, you can't be training somebody and find it. You've got to work ahead. And when we say a succession plan, we're not talking about just, I think we're clear, but there's two successions. Who's going to succeed you as owner? We're talking about who's going to succeed you in the next phase of the manager or salesperson you need to do that job based on wherever your talents were located and always always delegate to your weaknesses not to your strengths do what you do well 
and then find somebody else to compliment. I always look for people who could do things better than I could in certain areas. There was a reason I didn't run the accounting and wasn't the CFO of the company. I can read a great financial statement and tear it apart, but I could care less how the numbers get there as long as they're honest and they all add up. So, you know, are you a detailed person? Or, but start looking for that. I've, I've had a couple customers, the ops person has walked in and quit. And guess what? Mm -hmm. Nobody's behind them. Mm -hmm. Nobody's been getting groomed. So you have to think a couple, three positions behind or below you, whichever word you prefer. But I've got a great ops person. Well, who are you training to take their place as you move them up? As you grow your business, you should know how you're going to move your staff forward and who's capable of doing what. And so just for yourself, you've got to think, if you've got an ops person, who am I bringing on? And we've covered this and other things. We used to interview and look for people and even pay more on skill sets that we knew they had that they weren't going to use right away. And we would mm -hmm. plug them in. We'd tell them, we're plugging you into this right now. We'll just say it's a foreman job and they're capable yeah. supervisors. But we knew what was coming up, what we were going to sign, and who was leaving or who was going. And we were already starting to fill that position three to four months in advance. Did we pay more for having them do less work? Yeah, but a lot of times you've got to invest in your company that way. It mm -hmm. just makes sense. Because I'll tell you, the day you need that person, they're not going to be available because they've already it's taken it. It's too late. Too late. Didn't, yeah, you, you didn't prepare. This is, yeah. you got a problem. They're looking for a job. They're looking for a job. Mm -hmm. End right. of story. And say, well, I've got a file of people that, you know, two months ago applied. Yeah, they're not there. Well, <laughs> I, I, I got I to tell you a story. There was somebody that came in and uh, he was looking for a job and he was very, very competent. And he had come out of the air conditioning business. And he came to cleaning because there were some similarities with the HVAC service contracts and cleaning contracts. So that was his focus. At any rate, you know, I figured out that this is a very, very talented guy. And uh, what I thought was, hey, look, I can't afford this guy. You know, I mean, this guy needs, you know, X amount of dollars and I just, I can't afford him. So the guy that I couldn't afford <laughs> went on and signed up $15 million for a company out of Atlanta. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> How'd you feel about that, Ed? <laughs> you know, and we stayed in contact. That was one cool thing. We stayed in contact, but, you know, talk about major mistakes. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting you spend money you don't have to get people to come in that are talented that you can't put them to work. But thinking ahead, what are the holes you have to fill in your operations? And what kind of people do you need qualified and get them in? And if you can get them in and move them up, that's the best way to do it. Because mm -hmm. you may not find who you want when you need them. There, there's also some terrible, terrible stuff out there. I worked with one, it was a dreadful company. and. Don't and, mention their name. <laughs> and, I was, and I wasn't an employee. I was, you know, a contract consultant there. And he was just absolutely out of his mind crazy. And what happened was I walked in one time and he had really nice offices, you know, with this great big kidney shaped black, black lacquered desk, mm -hmm. you know, the kind that shouldn't be in a cleaning service's offices, <laughs> you know. Anyway, I walk in and he had this really nice young girl up, up front. And she's looking up at him and he's looking down at her. And I walked in as he was saying, if they're sticking red hot needles in your eyeballs, you never give out my home telephone number. <laughs> no, that was his approach to thing. But his philosophy was, and I mean, as soon as he told me, I said, well, that's the problem here. What he believed was that success in the cleaning industry is matched with the amount of distance you can put between yourself and the toilets. So I went to like the first building that he was having trouble with. And I went into the building and I found a supervisor and I says, I'm looking at the log book. And I was like, this looks like a horror story. And just look, let me tell you, I walked in here three days ago. Some big fat giant guy walked in, handed me the keys and told me I was in charge. And that's why things weren't going well. <laughs> you had just thrown somebody in there, just thrown oh. a, a warm body in there. to, to and, and look, we utilize warm bodies when it comes to cleaning and, and, and stuff like that. But I mean, you're not looking for warm bodies when it comes to anything beyond cleaning. So. No. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think, think we've that... all made that mistake. 
Yeah, and you have to review, and this would be one of the things owners do as they delegate more and get more off their plate. They have time for planning and analyzing your organizational chart or your staff as you have it and picking those people that you feel can be groomed and can be moved ahead and can be worked on to be moved into supervisor or higher level positions. That's, that's the kind of thing you should be doing with your time. Or a human resource department would be doing that if you have one. But making the time to do those things, to seek out the people that are promotable, that are people that you want to groom into first, second, and third spots after yours. Yeah, That's um, how you build your organization. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, and, and I'm guessing that we would all have different answers here, but what would be the most important quality that you're looking for in that second in command? I would have to say commitment to the company, commitment, team player on the same page as the owner with the drive and the forward movement of the company. That's what I would want. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm pretty close to what Sharon said. That's a hard question, Ed. I mean, there's so many variables. Yeah. But the first thing I would say is they, I'm looking for the skill set that I need both currently, as we've talked about, and what I'm going to need coming up based on the next year's projection. The other thing that I looked for was coachability. And then the third one is attitude. And I would look so for skill set, coachability, and attitude. Yeah. Is attitude, what you I, can't, can teach we the can't change thing. attitude. You can't change attitude. No. Well, I'm, How about I'm, you, Ed? Well, I'm giving away my Northeastern roots. But, you know, for me, what it always was, was uh, that trumped everything. Was lo- You give yeah. me one or two guys that are loyal, man, there is just about nothing that we can't do. I guess mm-hmm. commitment, that's what I was saying. Commitment, I would have to agree with that. that. That's very cl- yeah, no, that's that very close. But the loyalty thing is, uh, oh. that was foremost in my mind. You know, can I trust this guy? Is this guy, yeah. is, or is this person? Does he really have the good of the company and me and the rest of the organization? And w- what I did was I came up with this idea of three circles, okay? And it was whether or not it was on any given issue, Okay. Number one circle is how does it affect uh, the client? Number one. Okay. How does it uh, affect the company, the organization? Okay. And then how does that line up with their situation with you? So look, if it's good for the client, if it's good for the employees, if it's good for the company, okay, then that's a go. Mm -hmm. The initial interview, there was, there was these three circles. And one of my standard speeches was, look, this will be the only job you'll ever have where you have a mistake quotient. If you're not making any mistakes, you're not doing anything. So let's go back to Uh our three circles. You make a decision. And if it's the wrong one, tell me, what was it uh, as far as the uh, clients go, as far as the uh, staff goes, and as far as the company goes? And if they had good answers on all that stuff, it's like, you know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to eat this mistake because they did, they did what they were supposed to do. They did what they were supposed to do. And sometimes it, it didn't work out right. No. no, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. You're, you're just working trying. in a comfort zone and you're, you're right. not going to grow. Right. Uh, you have to make mistakes to grow. There's the only person that doesn't uh, make mistakes is uh, somebody that's not doing anything. You know, and by the way, that is the problem in large organizations. You have the jokes about, you know, how many senior VPs does it take to change a light bulb? Well, Mm -hmm. it's five. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's one to change a light bulb and then four to figure out what the cost center it has to go to. So that's a different twist. I thought you were going somewhere else, but that's okay. You've seen and you've experienced that. And that's an indicator for the kiss of death. The term empty suits has real weight. That is for real. That is for real. As you were talking there, I think as we come down to the close, a couple of things, you know, it's funny how you think about people who have coached you and mentored you. And I've seriously had that luxury since I've been 18. I've always had a coach, an advisor, Mm -hmm. or a mentor. And one of my longest mentors was like a little under 30 years. And he was an IBM exec. And I learned a ton of stuff from him. And he went through IBM when they were a service company. They were flipping from hardware to service. And I mean, they were considered top of the line back in the 60s and 70s and trained. I mean, you couldn't get better 
you could not go to college and get a better education than IBM would give you working for them. Mm-hmm. And he, and this is also in, a, in another book, but he was telling us, and it was an IBM lore story, but when Tom Watson was running the place, a guy made a $10 million mistake that had been with him for seven or eight years. And they said, well, you're firing him, right? And he said, no, I just paid $10 million for him to learn <laughs> what not to do and how to fix it. Why would I fire him? Keep it it's him. the first yeah. time in seven years. Yeah. So I mean, you can look that story up at the round. And I think the last thing is we're challenging everybody. The other thing IBM used to do, way back, I'm taping myself, way back in the day, they had a big placard. It was probably about three or four feet long, I can't remember, and a few inches high, maybe six or seven. And the words think on it in big, dark, bold print with an exclamation point. And the the message was simply, think before you act, think before you talk, make sure that what you're doing is going to achieve the objectives you want. Think, think it through, think about it, think about the people and your situation, the client, the customers, and how this is going to work out. And you, you will make a better decision. So our challenge is what are you thinking about your second in command and are they ready to step into the roles you have planned for them so you can grow your business. Ed, you want to take us out of here or what would you like to do? I always love our well, formal. You, well, you know, I think both of you have covered this pretty well, but I mean, without a second in command, you're just dead in the water. I mean, you're just not going to go anywhere. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many people that you can supervise. The, the, the guys that are, you know, running 40 people and it's the owner that's doing it or companies that's not going to go anywhere. They're just not going to happen. So I think with all that said, there's some uh, things for our audience to chew on. I'm really just kind of going to close this out and say thanks for listening. You know where to find us, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Music. Well, who did I miss? There's umpteen hundreds out there. We're everywhere, YouTube. YouTube, look for us, Polishing Profits. This will make Sharon happy. No, we're not the detailing company. So when you go out there and you look up and you see some guys with polishers in their hand, we're not the detail company. And that reminded me the other day, don't not the detail company. Their margins are higher than us. So with all (laughs) that said, thank you, audios. We'll catch you on the next episode.